more trees, more wildlife. We grew out of a collaboration between the town's Sustainable Lexington Committee and three nonprofits, the Lexington Field and Garden Club, Lexington Climate Action Network, and Citizens for Lexington Conservation. You can learn more about us, including how to sign up for our newsletter at our website, www.lexingtonlivinglandscapesjustlikeitsounds.org. Our great thanks to Claudia for joining us this evening and sharing her wisdom with us. And thank you, as always, to Matt and our friends at Cary Library for hosting this evening's program. We know many in our audience have learned about tonight's program through the many great organizations we're privileged to work with around the state. And so a warm welcome to all of you who found this program through the Massachusetts Pollinator Network, the Mystic Charles Pollinator Partnership, Grow Native Massachusetts, Mass Audubon, Lexing, excuse me, Lincoln Land Conservation Trust, and others. Also a warm welcome to any of Claudia's new neighbors at Piper Shores in Maine joining us this evening. We're very glad to have you with us. After Claudia's presentation, we'll have a Q&A session moderated by Charlie Wyman, another member of our Lexington Living Landscapes team. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, not the chat, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Let me now introduce our speaker and get out of the way. Claudia Thompson is a landscape ecologist and the founder of Grow Native Massachusetts and served as the organization's president and executive director through its first decade. Claudia's work as a landscape ecologist is deeply informed by her personal experience over three decades, transforming her relatively small urban garden in Cambridge into a rich habitat where she has documented more than 80 species of birds. Her lifelong career in the environmental sector has included other notable roles, serving as Director of Education for the Appalachian Mountain Club, Director of Drumlin Farm for Mass Audubon, and on the board of the New England Wildflower Society. Claudia, thank you so much for joining us this evening. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you to all of you at the library and at Lexington Living Landscapes for inviting me to discuss one of my very favorite subjects. The structure of tonight's program is uh, threefold. I'm going to spend just a couple minutes talking about the challenge in front of us, which can be a little depressing, but I think it's important to understand uh, the challenges we do face to preserve bird diversity and to reverse the declines that we're experiencing. And then I'm gonna have a lot of fun talking about what my landscape in Cambridge, Massachusetts taught me over 31 years while I was also working as an ecologist and an environmental educator. And then we're gonna distill that case study of my garden into the larger principles and lessons that involve supporting bird diversity. So here we go with the things that aren't quite so fun, but that we need to know about the challenge in front of us. About four or five years ago, uh, four years ago to be exact, Science Magazine published a peer re reviewed article in September of 2019. And I'm sure you probably know Science is a very highly respected journal. Uh, this was a result, this uh, article was a result of a very detailed and complex multi-year study, the absolute first of its kind, which was co-authored by 11 different scientists from nine different organizations in the United States and Canada. The lead author was Ken Rosenberg from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And the study showed the alarming loss of birds in the last 50 years. And it was so dramatic, the news was so dramatic that it was picked up by a lot of the mainstream media, you know, the, by the New York Times, Science News, media all over the country, and it got lots of attention. And, and the good side of that is it really had the result in waking up more and more people to the seriousness of this problem. And the net analysis of the study is this. Big news was that in 50 years in North America, the estimates are that we have lost 3 billion birds, or essentially about one third of all the birds that were here in North America in 1970. And these losses are being felt in every biome, in grassland birds, 
in forests, birds, you name it, every possible environmental habitat that they occupy. And the data for the study came from a tremendous amount of networks, monitoring networks, radar records, citizen science, which is well established in the ornithological world. And the importance is certainly very much about bird life, but it is also about biodiversity as a whole, because birds are really great biodiversity indicators about the health of our landscape. And because there's so many of us who love birds, they are one of the few fauna groups for which we can amass the kind of data to get the results that this study gave us. So the biggest declines are being felt in most of the populations, but the majority of the birds that are experiencing, say 90% of the declines are the wood warblers, sparrows, blackbirds, finches, flycatchers, thrushes, swallows, quail. Essentially for those of us in New England, all the birds that we love and see that are migrating birds in our woodlands and grass are the ones that are really suffering these severe declines. Now that said, there are even declines in some of the more common species like the Baltimore Orioles, like hummingbirds, kinglets, cardinals, jays and crows. Uh, the only positive news in the study, and it's good to, to have positive news, is that our waterfowl, many of our ducks, and some of our raptor populations have actually increased in the last 50 years rather than decreased. And that's because of conservation efforts, particular for in wetland species, certain wetland species, and certainly since the banning of DDT, uh, some of the raptor populations have recovered. Prior to the 2019 report that was published in Science, there was a coalition, and there's, there still is a coalition, of organizations that study birds and risk to birds called the North American Bird Conservation International, or NAPKI. And NAPKI in 2016 issued its very first conservation vulnerability assessment for all 1,100 plus native bird species that there are in North America, i.e. in the United States and Canada and Mexico. And so this was pretty important uh, science and information as well, because it gave us specific information about the risk to every single one of the species. And what NABKE found in their big picture was that of all the bird species that occupy North America, whether it's partly through their migratory life cycle or wholly in North America for their entire life cycle, that one third, 37% of all birds are on a, what they call a watch list for possible extinction. And what that means is they may not be on the endangered species list right now, but their pattern of population declines is so serious that they are at risk of actually then making it to the endangered species list. And they gave a conservation concern score for every single one of those 1,100 plus species. And so what I'm gonna do is take that information as it applies to what I call the New England and Mid-Atlantic land bird species. And let's look at how those species are being evaluated. There are about 180 species if we're in a landscape here in New England that we would expect to encounter eastern temperate forest birds, a few grassland birds, and some generalist birds. And of those species, the 180 species, 70 are classified as low concern, so relatively stable. 25 are watch list species, meaning that's in the group that NABKE says is really at high, high risk of heading towards extinction, towards endanger, endangerment. And then 85 species are of moderate concern, which means they're declining. There's some real risks that they face. And so that's about almost one half of the Eastern temperate birds. If you take a subset of those Eastern temperate birds and you just look at warblers, and warblers are of course all migrants, the dramatic uh, data is, is higher in terms of the danger. You have 39% of all warblers are on the watch list. And almost one half of all warblers are of moderate concern. And only 14% of the warbler populations are considered fairly stable or of low concern. And why is that? I think we know, we know it's 
logical why that is. Uh, warblers are migrants. It's the migrant birds that are suffering the most. And if you think about what life is like for, let's say, a migrating oven bird, which is in the warbler family, uh, they make a nest that's egg shaped like an oven, hence they're called an oven bird. That nest is laid on the ground floor, both the forest floor in leaf litter. It needs the protection of forest habitat. It needs to not be at risk to predators, dogs, cats, whatever. And so it's not surprising. It's a small, teeny little bird. It lays weighs less than an ounce. It depends on the insects in the leaf litter, and it's very sensitive to the forest fragmentation that's happened over the last half a century. And similarly, if you look at an example like a wood thrush, a wood thrush is actually a watch list species. So it's one of the ones at greatest risk. A wood thrush weighs just a little bit over an ounce and it migrates spring and fall. So you can see from the map that it spends its breeding season in Eastern United States and a little bit into Canada. And it spends its winter in Mexico. The blue is the, the wintering uh, season. And so non-breeding season. And so these birds that are migrating and many of them migrate further south than Central America, many of them go to South America, even the tips of South America. These birds are migrating thousands of miles back and forth each year. So, and they ha in, inhabit habitats that are increasingly unavailable as forest floors, leaf litter, dense protected environments where there's not tons of development. So, and when you think about how much leaf litter we leave in our gardens and our landscapes now, I mean, that's like the typical way of landscaping is to just clean up everything. And so it's not surprising that we're getting very big losses in these types of birds. So according to NABKEY, these are the species that they put on the watch list. And you'll see again, the woodcock, sparrows, many, many warblers, the wood thrush, and these are some of the species, and these are just examples of the types of birds that show up as being of conservation concern in our New England landscapes. So again, lots of warblers, uh, the eastern screech owl, even uh, flycatchers, orioles, the orchard oriole, not not the Baltimore. Uh, and you'll, if you know and love these birds, you'll you'll recognize many of them. Now there are also a birds with more stable populations. Uh, there are native birds that are more generalist, meaning they have the ability to ha inhabit multiple types of environments and to adapt a little bit better to those different types of environments as well as to human activity. And while those birds species, and these are again, just examples in the robin, the hummingbirds, et cetera. While these are just examples, uh, some of them are stable populations, a few are even increasing, but some of them are even decreasing a little bit. And then we have, a small group of birds that have dominant or increasing populations. And many of those are non-native species that have overtaken uh, habitats in a very, very, very aggressive way. And if just a couple of them are native species. So for example, we have our introductions from Europe of the house sparrow and the European starling produced in the 1800s. Um, the house sparrow was uh, very aggressive when it was first introduced and seen as very aggressive right off the bat. And it's reported that people, someone who loved Shakespeare and thought that Shakespeare's birds, the starling, uh, needed to be here in America. So the starlings were released, released Central Park in 1890. Also, the non-native pigeon, the rock pigeon, in contrast to our of what we might call dove bird is the common name, was introduced way before that in Nova Scotia. Pigeons are pretty amazing, but I think most of us know how dominant pigeons can become uh, in the landscape. And mute swans also were uh, introduced primarily in the 1800s to zoos and to estates. Some, there were big estates and people wanted swans swimming around their ponds. Uh, most of the ones that have escaped now are feral populations. They weren't deliberately introduced into our uh, broader environment, but they are so aggressive and their uh, ability to reproduce is such that they have become quite big pests. People always think they look lovely, but they are pests. 
and they're very destructive to the aquatic vegetation of our waterways and they're very, very aggressive to native birds. There are two species in particular that are noteworthy for being native to North America that are also uh, have populations so high that they are tremendously destructive to the balance of bird diversity. Uh, the first being the Canada goose. And the reason that Canada geese have become such pests is that they were, uh, their populations were very low in the 1800s. And the concern about that led to actual breeding and restoration programs from wildlife officials. And the breeding populations that were raised became non-migratory because they were raised on farms. And the, so the offspring of those birds lost the normal migratory instinct because the wild Canada geese are long distant migrants from Canada to South America. But most of the populations that we encounter now are not migratory populations. And in fact, um, in Massachusetts alone, uh, there were 6,000 North Dakota bred birds that were released, I think it was sometime in the 1950s. And right now, the um, estimated Canada goose population in the United States is over 5 million. So the, the effects of them is really felt everywhere. And in addition to the Canada goose, the brown headed cowbird is also very aggressive to eastern woodland birds and to species here in the Northeast. That was originally a Midwestern grassland bird. But because of the suburbanization of America, that has created the habitat that has allowed them to disperse their populations much more broadly throughout the United States. So that's just an overview to say, where are we with birds in general that we encounter in the landscape? And so if the goal is to create landscapes for bird diversity, then we have to ask ourselves, what, is our, what diversity are we looking to achieve? And what is our goal? And I'm a fan of Aldo Leopold, who's a well-known conservationist, and I love this quote from him. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. And we humans now have such a broad impact ourselves on all of the lands throughout the world and certainly all of the lands around us, that we are in many ways the managers and decision makers that will determine how that stability is maintained or how it is not maintained. So I think the goal is simple. We want to support life for the native species that are especially those at risk and especially those with declining populations if we want to have bird diversity. And what that means in essence is we need to be supporting most of the native species because most of them are really suffering declines. And how do we do it? What do we all need? We all need food. We all need shelter. That's what any organism needs. So providing habitat and food is doing the same thing at the same time. Habitat, the good habitat inherently provides great food. So let's have a little fun now after that and look at what my garden taught me over three decades. It really, in many ways, is the birds that led me to found Grow Native Massachusetts. I, re I really loved the birds and learning so much about how they behaved in my own landscape taught me a lot. I grew up in the 1950s and 1960s in upstate New York, and my family had 100 acres. Uh, we worked the land. We had a a tree farm, meaning we managed that that land in some way. And I also worked in environmental education throughout most of my career, as you heard in the int introduction uh, for Appalachian Mountain Club, etc. Uh, but it was really not until I worked on my small garden in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that I learned that my framework for looking at conservation changed and that I learned so much about how we can do so much to conserve birds and to protect birds. So if you fast forward from my childhood, in the early 1980s, I married a wonderful guy named Roger Booth, and he was the director of urban design for the city of Cambridge. And he wanted to live in Cambridge because he really was passionate as an architect and urban designer about the public realm of cities. And he was like, I want to live in Cambridge. This is my city. 
I was more inclined to want to live out um, beyond Lexington <laughs> in maybe Concord or the western suburbs where there was more open space. But we agreed to live in Cambridge and this was this was the fixer upper we bought in 1992 so you can see it needed quite a bit of work. And this is what the the backyard looked like in 1992 uh, and. It was really by being. Uh, creating a garden ultimately from scratch essentially on this small piece of land that I learned so much more about how to be a steward and what. I could possibly accomplish as an ecologist or a conservationist. Sometimes limitations are a good lesson. So here's an aerial view of the two family house that we had and the lot was 7,300 square feet, which was good sized by Cambridge standards, but not good sized uh, by uh, suburban standards and not as large as some of the larger houses in Brattle Street and Cambridge. And what was also nice about these particular lots where we lived was they backed up to each other. So there was a little bit of open space between the houses on these lots. And after five years of uh, working on the landscape was a lot cheaper than fixing the house at first. So, so we kind of focused on that for the first few years. And we had started to make some real changes to that dumpy landscape that you saw. We were fixing the house too, I admit, but we were really focused on the landscape. And so here's a sketch from back then. And what had happened is we'd taken down that horrible old garage. Um, you know, as again, as a child growing up on a hundred acres, I had never really gardened because the woods were right there, but I was now undertaking the creation of a, of a space, which you could call a garden or you could call a landscape. And in the 1990s, uh, that was the decade, certainly in Massachusetts and a little bit, I think in other parts of New England, where we really started to pay attention to invasive species. That was the era when uh, the Massachusetts Invasive Plant Advisory Group was formed. I don't think it had those groups had yet been formed quite in the other New England states. Um, it was the first state to establish a prohibited plant list. And I got fully on that bandwagon as a person. So these were the 11 species of invasive plants, 7,000 plus square foot property, all of which I basically successfully controlled or removed. And that was that was cool. That was good. And I began when I began to garden in 1993. I started conventionally, I think the way most people start, which is I didn't have a plan. I used native plants. I used non native plants. I picked species based on their aesthetics and cold hardiness. When we first took down that dumpy old garage. Um, I we had to bring in some topsoil to fill where a lot of rubble had been taken out and I said well let's go to Weston nurseries and get some plants and and Roger said well it's your birthday so you can pick out whatever you want and I he didn't have any idea how many plants I could fit in the car um, but again I was really just getting plants that appealed to me without any kind of the framework that I have today about the importance of native plants. But I quickly began to use more native species in part because I liked their aesthetic and in part because I in, just intuitively wanted a kind of dynamic, a little bit of a self-sustaining landscape. But the other thing that happened was the more native plants I started using, I started seeing more birds. So by the late 1990s, or about 2000, I started documenting the species I saw in our gardens. And this is what our garden looked, where the garage was after about 15 years. And so there had been many tree plantings, there had been moving of trees, uh, the neighbor's elm tree had died, so all of a sudden my shade went to sun. But I was starting to understand the plants more and I was starting to see more birds and I was beginning to understand the, the seasonal cycles. And this was the tipping point for me of changing my conservation paradigm and realizing that my landscape could be a critical player. I remember at one point uh, going into a, a meeting when I was on the board member of uh, New England Wildflower so Society and now Native Plant Trust and just bubbling about how many birds I was seeing in my garden. And it was just, 
it just completely changing how I looked at things. It was very, very exciting. And the net result of the work in changing that landscape over the years was that, as you heard in the introduction, I have documented 81 species using that garden in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Of those, two were watch list species, uh, American woodcock and wood thrush, both of which had stopped and used my garden in various ways during the, particularly the spring migratory season. It was pretty amazing the first time we saw woodcocks stop over. That, that first woodcock we saw must have flown in for, if not 500, 1,000 miles or quickly before it got there and it was exhausted and it spent 24 hours just hanging out in the back before it probably went out to Lincoln and Concord or somewhere else. And then we used to, and I would say not so much in the latter years, we used to pretty regularly see the wood thrushes migrate through in the spring. So that's really exciting to me that to have that many birds using the habitat that I created, and it was not that way when I bought the house or when Roger and I bought the house, you could, you could be guaranteed that. And so here are a few of the other species that we documented in our garden. These are all species of moderate concern. These are species that are all in decline. Again, most of them are migratory. And so that habitat that we created was tremendously important to them. And now what I'm gonna do is give you a little bit of a tour of that small garden as best as I can and just chat about some of the plants, some of the birds and then we'll take it from there. So by the back porch was this cluster of Amelanchia trees. They're a particularly nice native tree. They have beautiful fall color and they're very, very valuable to birds. Uh, and so one principle is it's nice to plant things in clusters. That gives a little bit of a massing that's also birds tend to see and respond to, I think. Now, Amelanchias have berries that birds love. But what I love about this is uh, this is a Wilson's warbler and the Wilson's warbler, if you look at it, you can see is eating the caterpillar. It's pulling that little green caterpillar out from the stem of the Amelanchia. So here's a beautiful native tree, well known for its berries as bird food, but it is actually providing caterpillars. So it's providing insects as well as berries for many species of birds. There are many species that love the Amelanchias. These are cedar wax wings that uh, love the Amelanchia berries. And every June 1st, I swear, on the nose, a little flock of cedar wax wings would fly overhead, see those Amelanchia trees with their high pitched little and they'd come down and they'd check out the berries and the berries were usually still green. And often they'd fly off and then they'd come back a week later when the berries were ripening. Uh, I didn't see, this is a Baltimore Oriole who was visiting those same Amelanchia trees. And I did not routinely see the Baltimore Orioles in the Amelanchias, but this was interesting because in May of 2021, there was an infestation of aphids in the Amelanchias. And the Baltimore Orioles were constantly in those trees doing aphid duty. So they were cleaning up these pests and taking care of her. I never sprayed the trees, but the Orioles took care of it for me. Now, one of the things that I think worked about the garden was that there were lots of layers front to back. So there were lots of spots for birds to come into. Uh, landscape architects sometimes will call that making rooms. So instead of just having one open, boring space, you've got lots of interesting places that birds respond to. Uh, there are places for privacy, there are places for discovery, there are places of protection, uh, places of interest. Birds don't love to just hang out and wave at you. You know, they, they have this way of hiding from you, especially when you want to take their photograph. Uh, here's a Viri in the back garden searching for insects. And Viri is a thrush, and all the thrushes, again, are looking for insects in the leaf litter. They very much like to sit, stay tucked out of sight. Uh, White-throated sparrows, uh, great birds. They're always foraging for insects in the leaf litter. If you guys know birds or any of you who do, they like to do a little dance back and forward, and that's how they actually stir up the insects so that you can get them. And if we were here live, I'd demonstrate it for you, but don't have to do that on Zoom. Uh, but again, the, the 
importance of leaf litter and the importance of a healthy soil is what is providing food for those sparrows. And the northern flicker was also a regular uh, visitor to our garden. It, you might be able to see in its beak that it has some ants. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see in the photograph, but flickers will feed on the barks of trees and in crevices, but they are very much ground feeders and they love ants and grubs. So if you've got a healthy soil, even if you have a little grass, that's where they will be feeding. And again, uh, chemicals will deter, uh, that deter insects are not good for the birds. Uh, and so you wanna give them the, that healthy food that they need. Now, one of the interesting things about my back garden in that lot in Cambridge is that I lived where they used to make a lot of bricks for New England. So it was a very solid clay subsoil. And my back garden, when it rained, did not drain at all. It just held the rain totally. And I wanted to use that as a positive to the habitat. Some of my neighbors would try to flatten it out and make all of their backyards grass. But I really appreciated that it gave me, in many ways, in that small 7,000 square hundred feet, a more diverse landscape. It gave me opportunity for different kinds of plants, like these may apples that like to have it wet. So I embraced the occasional flooding of the backyard. And here it is. This would be typically what my back garden would look like after a three quarter or one inch rainfall. And it didn't come up to the house, which was good, uh, but it made for enough of an interesting environment that here's a northern water thrush in my back garden. So part of the diversity I'm getting is that diversity of landscapes on the site. It doesn't mean I get the northern water thrush all year, but as it's migrating through, some great habitat for it. And one spring, I think it was 2019, it was wet enough back there for a period of many weeks that we had a multi, a family of, um, well, it was a family, but we had a, a group of red-winged blackbirds that stayed for a couple of weeks just in our back garden in Cambridge. Water is, of course, a very important habitat requirement for all birds. Uh, here are tufted tip mice. Here's an adult on my little bird bath with its young. I don't know if it nested quite on my property, but it must have been nearby. Here's a cat bird, a pretty regular visitor. They did nest somewhere in the back. Again, I don't know exactly if it, which side of the fence it was on, but they definitely nested right in the area. And a common yellow throat warbler. Uh, the warblers are the hardest to photograph, so I have the fewest photographs of the warblers. Uh, but we had it was such a delight to see the warblers come through. And again, the bird bath was right next to a lot of leaf litter. So not only did the birds come and get water, but they could get insects and rustle around and, and do their normal things all in the same place. Uh, we had morning doves. Uh, they like quiet secluded spots and they're almost exclusively ground feeders. Uh, they do primarily eat seeds, but an important part of their diet is snails. Uh, they really need the calcium in order to lay their eggs and they're known, uh, as you can see in the lower picture, for fanning their wings out and sunning themselves. That's one of their favorite little things to do. They're kind of our native, what you might call our native pigeon. They're very fast flyers. They can actually, when they're flying, go up to 50 miles an hour. Here's a red-bellied woodpecker. Uh, the, this is a silver maple tree trunk that was at the back corner of the property. And it was one of the only uh, trees that we left uh, as we were planting many things. And so many birds would forage in the bark of that tree. The tree was perfectly healthy, but there are many insects that actually live in the bark. And it was really neat. You'd Sometimes you'd see nuthatches foraging in the bark, tip mice, woodpeckers, flickers, brown creepers, sometimes warblers, red starts. So that big tree was an important part of the habitat. And it's interesting to note that uh, here's a picture of the tree canopy in my garden about maybe a little over 20 years after we started doing the planting, probably around 2015. We planted every single plant 
that you see in that garden on that property, except that silver maple at the back that we just saw, and except one rhododendron at the back porch that was the favorite of a homeowner in the a homeowner back in the 1950s, which I didn't want to take. It was Mrs. Katrupa's rhododendron. Every single thing you see here we planted. And we planted most of the trees probably in the first eight years off and on, you know, a few a year. And it's incredible, it's incredible how fast things do grow. And succession in the garden happens. It's constantly growing, it's changing the light. And it, it's really, it, I would encourage you to not be uh, afraid of planting because you think it'll take a long time. I think you'll be amazed at how fast things grow if they're the right plant in the right place and they're well established. So we had American goldfinches that love to come and eat the, the thuya seeds. Thuyas are Eastern white cedars. We had those right by the back porch. And we would also see in those trees, finches and pine siskins. And one year we even had an eruption of white winged crossbills. Uh, the blue jay nested in the thuya at least one year and right by the house. And of course, blue jays are common birds. But what I thought was very cool, if you look at the tufts of white feathers under that blue jay right at the nest, those are the three young ones that mom is sitting on. And it was really neat to have them nesting right there within like literally within 10 feet of us uh, down lower off the back porch. And then at the back door, we I had this lovely batch of cardinal flower and some rudbeckia and a few other plants and hummingbirds and cardinal flowers are a perfect match. Uh, we always got hummingbirds when we had cardinal flower and if you plant cardinal flower or trumpet honeysuckle, I can almost guarantee that you will get ruby throated hummingbirds. Hummingbirds need the nectar, but they also need insects. And there's a perfect mutualistic coevolutionary relationship of hummingbirds and cardinal flower. The cardinal flower has this long corolla and that's perfect for the long hummingbird tongue. So it's a great nectar source for hummingbirds. And as far as we know, uh, hummingbirds are the only animal that actually helps the cardinal flower to reproduce that carries the pollen from one plant to another. And the other thing that cardinal flowers love, which I learned at some point is they need cardinal flowers are biennials, so any cardinal flower plant will only live for a couple of years and then unless it has seeded itself, you'll lose your cardinal flower. But in order to reproduce, cardinal flower needs disturbance. The seeds actually need disturbance and not too much competition in order to germinate. So the reason I planted the cardinal flower at the downspout in the back corner was with the hope that the disturbance of the water rushing down the downspout would help perpetuate the cardinal flower by dispersing the seeds in my garden. And indeed that worked. So the cardinal flower here is a view from what we were just looking at towards the woodland garden. And you see cardinal flower growing into the woodland garden. And now those were seeds that just got washed into that space that, that volunteered where they wanted to grow. And then that meant more hummingbirds. It, it was really fun in the summer. Roger and I would go to the back door and we would often see a hummingbird and we would try not to scare it, but we could never could go out our back door without scaring the hummingbirds off. And here's a kingbird uh, in the river birch gleaning for insects. Uh, if we go on, we have a sharp shin hawk that showed up one day and sharpies, as those of us who love birds know, like to prey on other songbirds. And so it was probably looking for some other smaller bird to pounce on. Uh, we had red tail hawks come around regularly and this red tail was on top of a snag that I created in the back and I did see in our garden landscape with the taller trees um, of the neighborhood red tail hawks that would eat I saw them eat crow I saw them eat squirrel and I saw them eat rats so good habitat for the red tail. And finally, um, as I was so getting so into the bird life in the garden, I decided I wanted to create a snag to see if we could get woodpeckers to nest. 
And I had quite a debate with my husband, Roger, about it. He was not convinced that by cutting down a tree and leaving the trunk standing, uh, that it would look great. And I prevailed debate because I basically insisted and said, come on, we're going to get woodpeckers to nest. We're going to get woodpeckers to nest. So in 2008, we did take this silver maple, which had been in the middle of the backyard, and I had planted next to it the river birch, which I wanted to take its place. And we cut the silver maple down and left that tall standing trunk to create a snag, a piece of standing deadwood that birds might use as habitat. And yeah, it looked a little stubby in the winter when we first created it, but I think you can see from the bottom right photo that the landscape grew in around it and you didn't even see it. So that snag is there in the middle of that photo, but you don't even know it's there. And what's pretty darn cool is that it worked. So five years after we created the snag and the wood was decaying, it had gotten soft enough. We were sitting on our back porch on in April of 2013 and I looked over and I said, Oh my gosh, it's working. There was the male downy woodpecker working on his nest hole. And it obviously wasn't the first day that he'd been creating that hole. So he came around for days and days and worked on digging that hole, drilling that hole with his beak. The flicker came by, the northern flicker came by to check it out, but Mr. Downey was not going to give up his hole and the flicker moved on. And this was a male, male downy woodpecker, and he worked generally a couple hours a day and he would come back every day and dig out the hole. And it took him two weeks from the time we first saw him start to get to this point. So after two weeks of work, work he's almost all the way into his nest hole. And all of a sudden he got all the way inside, popped out and turned around. And it was like, oh my gosh, he's, he's getting that hole big enough that he can go inside now. And then several days later, this is the female. The female came by, this was April 21st, and she seemed to kind of neaten up the hole around the edges and peck at it a little bit. And we thought, wow, I mean, this was two and a half or more weeks that we had watched mostly the male drill that nest hole, go in, dig it out. The male would go in far enough later in the drilling of the nest hole that he'd come out with his head and spit out the wood chips like this, and they'd scatter down to the ground. So it was a lot of work. And the, a lot of the bird resources will say that the male and the female share the nest building. But in this case, I have to say the male did most of it. She came along at the end and kind of neatened it up. And then there was a flutter of the two birds together. And I thought, should I be watching this? I'm not quite sure if they're mating right now. And it seemed pretty quick. And then it was really quiet. And for many weeks, it was really quiet. And I thought, I wonder, was it successful? Did she lay eggs? Do they have a brood? And oh, yes, this is May 1st. Six weeks since I first saw the downy working on his hole. And what was happening is both mom and dad were flying back to the nest hole and they're feeding, if you can see it, this is the female, I believe, and she, in her beak, she has about eight caterpillars and she's feeding this guy. And this is a small male. You can't see the spot on the back of his head, but he is a male. We knew there were several young in the nest hole and the mom and dad are flying back constantly with these wads of caterpillar and feeding them. And, and there's he, the male in particular was sticking his heads out and just chowing down every caterpillar they brought. And we had a uh, creative names for the two. This was big bro. Cause we, he seemed to be the first one out of the hole. We knew there was a female that was also getting fed, uh, but he was the noisiest and he was the loudest. And this was June 1st. So we're now six weeks since the woodpeckers have mated. There's been a period of little more than two weeks where they incubated the eggs and a period of three plus weeks where those eggs went from hatching to the maturity that you see of this bird right now. So here's the male, a young one. It was a very hot day. 
the parents had stopped feeding them quite so much. They were clearly ready for these young ones to fledge. And finally, uh, we were, I happened to be lucky enough to grab my camera and be sitting underneath this young male downy woodpecker thrust himself out of the hole, grabbed the side of the tree for dear life. And seconds later, literally seconds later, he flew over to those famous Amalankia trees I was showing you in the beginning, tries to eat a totally green berry. Remember, it's June 1st. He's swinging in the breeze and he can hardly hang on to this branch. And then he flew over to this chemociferous tree in the middle of the yard and just rested for a few minutes. I mean, this bird is two minutes out of its nest, its first flight. And doesn't it look like a newly minted bird? I mean, it just looks like it's it has not been out in the world before. Those feathers are so young. And then after resting for a couple minutes on that tree trunk, he starts gleaning for insects all the way up the trunk. He got further up the tree and he flew off at 3.41 p.m., 12 minutes after fledging out of the hole. Now, if you're a downy woodpecker parent, your work is now done. You've raised your young, you've protected them, you've fed them, and they fledge and they are on their own. Not all woodpeckers are like that, but that's what the downies are like. So it was just a thrill to see this whole process. And his little sister, whom we had dubbed Little Sis, was still in the hole. And she clearly had been sat on by her big brother and not gotten as many caterpillars. And the parents were not feeding, they would feed her a tiny bit. For the next few days, they did not feed her much. And then even though she was not as strong as her big brother, after those three more days, she too, uh, I was gone that morning, but I used to, every time I was gone, I would be constantly checking the hole to see if she had fledged. And I came back after a meeting one morning, and here's what we call little sis. She was high up in the tree, a little bit less vigorous, but she too flew off. And so I would have to say that's been one of my coolest uh, urban gardening bird experiences was to create this snag and to realize that I could create the habitat for these woodpeckers to nest. And I could sit on my back porch over a period of several months and watch this and enjoy this. Something I had never seen growing up on a hundred acres in this vast woodland environment. So we had other birds that came to the garden as well. Scarlet tanager, which is a kind of rare sighting. They don't hang out in the cities a lot, but again, it was probably migrating through before it went off to a much more wooded place. And I will say that there are two big reasons why so many birds came to our garden in Cambridge. Those would be that there is precious little habitat for these birds. And there is so much of a need for it that they're gonna come occupy it wherever they can find it. So if we create it, they will come. And the other thing is, it also just goes to show how possible it is to create that habitat, that we don't need 100 acres, we don't need 10 acres, we don't need an acre, that every piece of land that we steward matters. And that was what led to the Grow Native tagline or motto, which is every garden matters, every landscape counts. And happily, just to let you know, the house after many years was, the garden was good, but also we fixed up the house, so it was no longer the dump that it once was. And here's the front with my non-native daffodils that burst out in the spring and the native plants would kind of grow in and come after them throughout the season. So let's distill this into what I think are the uh, seven most important principles for creating habitat and food for birds. Native plants, essential, leaf litter, and seed heads and organic processes in your garden are essential. We'll talk a little bit about vertical edge, which is the canopy layers that birds occupy, the importance of cover and topography, the importance of water, snags and dead trees we've just talked about quite a bit. And then we'll, in the end, we'll talk a little bit more about um, house sparrows and other aggressive species that we don't want. 
So native plants are absolutely the essential food source if we are going to have birds in our environment. And why is that? Well, what do birds eat? So of course it depends. Songbirds don't eat exactly the same thing as birds of prey, et cetera. But if we look at songbirds, which are about 50% of the species, what do they eat? They eat insects, fruits, and seeds. In the spring and summer, for almost all songbirds, the primary diet is insects. And why is that? Because one, what happens in New England in the spring? We have insects. Those birds, many of them have migrated in. They need protein. They need, that is what they have in the landscape as their source of food. We don't have most of our fruits and seeds yet in the spring, those come in the fall. And even for fall and winter feeding of birds, insects are still a primary food source for many of them. And then think about what it takes to raise those baby birds, like those lovely downy woodpeckers that I had. The only thing that baby birds eat or fed are insects. Here's a wood thrush feeding its young, one of our watch list species. And virtually all of the American terrestrial birds feed their young solely on insects. And it, it's obvious why. They have to grow. They can't grow at the rates that they grow without that high level of protein. And so if we are gonna have birds reproducing and if we're gonna sustain our populations, we have to have a lot of insects to sustain those birds. And the truth is that native plants actually host insects in a balanced way in the ecosystem and non-native plants tend not to. And it has to do with the whole evolutionary process of those ecological relationships of what eats what in the ecosystem. And Doug Tallamy's research has shown, he's an entomologist, so he's somebody who's studied insects all his career, that native ornamental plants support 29 times the biodiversity of non-native ornamentals. And he's measured the insect life on native plants versus non-native life. And it is that insect life that is essential to the whole ecosystem and essential to birds in particular. Now, I'm guessing that many, many of you know about Doug's work. He's quite well known uh, in the ecological world, in the gardening world, certainly in the native plant world. He's one of the, the best teachers on this subject. If you by any chance have not read his books or not been exposed to them, I highly recommend them. He's an amazing, amazing uh, writer and uh, his knowledge is superb. And so again, if you want native plants, if you want birds, you need native plants. And these books will tell that story in spades. Uh, Doug was not the very first person to understand this, uh, although he often has raised the question of, well, how many caterpillars would it take, for example, to raise a clutch of chickadees? And he says, well, it'll take between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars just to raise a clutch of say six baby chickadees. That was based on original research that was done by William Brewer and others in 1961, where they basically counted mealworms that chickadee parents took to the young to see how many they took to the nest. And that was how that number really was originated. But whatever it takes, whether it's 5,000, whether it's 6,000, whether it's 7,000, if it takes that many caterpillars to raise one batch of baby birds of one species, think of how many we need to have in our environment. And that's why we need a preponderance of native plants. So if you want to have an impact on your landscape, I suggest starting with your trees and shrubs, because trees are the anchors of the landscape. and they will also host the most Lepidoptera, the most uh, caterpillar species, and they cost the most, they're the hardest to plant. Uh, so you wanna think about the trees and shrubs that you're putting in, in order to make a difference to biodiversity. Now, trees as hosts for Lepidoptera, Lepidoptera are just moths and butterflies. It's the scientific name for that group of, of creatures. And, because Lepidoptera, because caterpillars are very, very important as bird food, that's why Doug uses them as an indicator of the best host species, the best kind of trees to plant. So oaks are his absolute favorite. 
uh, because there are about 80 different species of oaks in North America and the total number of Lepidoptera species that they host are over 500. Any of these are good trees to plant. Um, even if you're not planting the, the ones that host the most, any native tree that you plant is going to be a good host plant. Uh, but certainly oaks and cherries and birches and maples are really, really important. Uh, there's a longer list, and these are, again, lists that you can get out of reading his uh, literature or going to some of the websites of, again, how important are these particular species in our environment in terms of the caterpillars they'll provide. And then a question is raised is, okay, so if native plants are essential, how much of the landscape needs to be native plants so that we can sustain bird populations? And this is a graph from a study that was done uh, by Desiree Narango, and she published the report back in 2018. What she did in Washington, D.C. was study Carolina chickadees. And so she took the suburban environment and studied how much native tree biomass there was versus non-native tree, and found that unless the native tree biomass was at least 70%, it was not enough to sustain the, the caterpillars and the insect life that those birds needed. So that the moral of the story is you want at least 70% of your biomass, and that's, again, this is one study in one particular situation, but you want a substantial proportion of your plant biomass to be native if we're not going to have declining bird populations. In my own garden, I, over the years, again, I didn't say everything had to be native. I had a few favorite uh, lavenders and other plants. I have my bulbs, but I did ultimately, because I felt like the plants really worked well together, have about 90% of the plants in my garden be native plants. Now, in addition to the native plants, we've talked a little bit about leaf litter and how important it is. Uh, I would say it's pretty equally important to have that leaf litter and the healthy uh, soil ecosystem working to have to sustain bird life. Uh, so again, think about how much leaf litter has been lost in the way gardening has been typically done in the last 50 years with very much the suburbanization of our environment. And then think about what birds need. And again, these are all ground nesting birds that depend on finding little creatures in the soil. And here are the kind of creatures that they would find in a healthy soil with a leaf, leaf litter layer. Uh, almost all of these are arthropods, they're arthropods and a few worms, but there are all kinds of juicy little treats in there that are essential to their diet. So in my own garden, this is what it looked like in the fall, and the leaf litter would be delivered every fall, a leaf at a time, gently. I didn't have to buy it, I didn't have to do anything, and it was wonderful. And I, I loved that there was that fall texture, there was that fall color. And I once had a landscaper who said to me uh, in the spring when he was leaf blowing my neighbor's property, he says, hey lady, if you don't blow the leaves off your property in the spring, your plants won't come up. And I thought, oh my gosh, well, what happened? What did plants do before humans were running around with their leaf blowers? But it's not true. This was uh, my garden in spring, and in spring, all those beautiful woodland wildflowers and ground covers would emerge up through the leaf litter. And within uh, a month or two, this is what the ground plane in my woodland garden would look like. Came up perfectly. The leaf litter was nourishing the soil. I never, uh, I probably early in my gardening used some fertilizers. I stopped using fertilizers. Uh, the only, the fertilizers were the leaf and the cycling of the nutrients and the soil ecosystem working. So here's a lovely grouping of this low bush blueberry, uh, bloodroot, native azaleas, ferns. And leaf litter, as I mentioned before, surrounded by bird bath, which made the bird bath attractive and useful for the birds. And here we have the sparrows doing their little dance in the leaf litter getting their food, our watch list wood thr thrush looking for food in the leaf litter. And leaf litter is not just used for the insects and the food life that's in it. It's used for nesting materials. Uh, it's 
where many butterflies and moths reproduce. And so we don't have, we will not have butterfly and moth populations unless we leave those ecosystems working and leave that leaf litter layer working because butterflies and moths die after they reproduce. And a lot of the offspring, the either the eggs or the cocoons or the uh, pupa will overwinter in the leaf litter. Even a few adult butterflies will overwinter in the leaf litter. So it's tremendously important. And along with leaf litter, you know, of course, seed heads are important to birds, not cutting down all your seed heads, not cutting down all your uh, fall plant material, not being too neat. You know, don't take a rest from your fall cleanup. You don't have to clean up everything. It all has a value in the ecosystem. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the vertical edge, i.e. the canopy layers that you might have in your garden and in your environment. So vertical edge is just a very simple concept. Certain bird species tend to like to occupy high canopy, like tall trees, and that would be Orioles, for example. And the sharp shinned hawk that was in my garden, it likes to be at the mid canopy layer and the flicker really likes the ground plane. Of course, it will not every bird says, well, I'm only going to be in one spot. But the more canopy layers you have, the more variety of bird species you're going to have. So this is a, a nice diagram from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology showing that typically different birds will be in the overstory, the midstory or the understory kind of logical uh, thesis. So in the high canopy, again, no birds are exclusive to one or the other, but you'll tend to get hawks and crows, swallows and orioles. Uh, a lot of warbles will occupy all over the place, um, but they'll certainly like the high canopy. And in your mid canopy, you'll get generally a slightly different mix of birds. So you wanna have some mid-level trees. You wanna have, again, something, the more variety you have, the, the more birds you'll have. And at your shrub layer, You'll also have some different species. You'll get more of the thrushes, uh, robins, wrens, certainly certain sparrows, catbirds really occupy those lower layers. And down at the ground level, especially you're gonna be supporting the ground feeding birds or the ground nesting birds that really like to hide out at the lower level. And then of course, cover and topography is very important to birds. One of the things that still amazes me is that when fall and winter come and the leaves come off the trees, I see nests everywhere. And I think, wow, that nest was right there and I was walking under it all season long and I didn't even know that that uh, bird raised a family there. So it just goes to show how important cover is for birds that they often will occupy places quite close to human beings but they will, it will be safe enough for them to do so if they feel protected and if they have the protection of cover. And both um, evergreen cover and deciduous cover is really important. So evergreen cover, of course, is going to give you a little bit more of a windbreak year round. Uh, but deciduous cover is very, very important to many species of bird and their birds. And they really, you know, the privacy is so important to them. Here are some of my favorite trees and shrubs, and we don't have time to go through the whole list, but there's so many native trees and shrubs and trees and shrubs are greatly in need of planting. I definitely suggested thinking about um, trees as one of your important early decisions and adding to the landscape because of how they're going to grow over time. But likewise, in terms of shrubs, there is not enough shrubby habitat for birds. And in my garden, I often ask myself, did I try to cram too much in? And it's partly because I'm a plantaholic. I would come home with something else I wanted to fit in my garden. But I would say that one of the benefits of having wanted to put so many things in is that I created spaces that did have a lot of protections for birds. It had a lot of density and had a lot of secret spots that they like to hang out in that weren't visible to me a lot of the time. So you also want to have topographic features. One thing that, that you'll notice also is birds love to hop on rocks. You can't have too many rocks in a garden. They love to jump around. You can't have too many nooks and crannies. You can take a log 
and put it in your garden as a little artistic piece. So here was a log that I put in my garden as I was planting around it. 10 years later, you see the lower picture, you see that it was basically gone. But the entire time that it was there in the garden, it was slowly decaying. It was a home for insects, it helped create food in the landscape. And it was really just looked natural there, it looked great. Now, water is really important to birds, um, obviously for drinking, for bathing. Uh, birds don't care a lot for swimming pools, which is why we don't see them as much in big suburban environments. Uh, but there, if you don't have, if you have water on your site naturally, you're lucky. But if you don't have water on your site, there are some nice things you can do to help provide it. So, this is not where you will see birds in either of these bird baths, and here's why: they're too deep for the birds, and they're slippery surfaces. It's pretty amazing to me how many bird baths you could go buy that would actually have relatively little value for birds themselves. They look nice, but not necessarily as useful as they should be for the birds. Uh, here's what I did in my garden, which I had a very naturalistic bird bath on the ground. Uh, it, again, blended into the whole environment. I had the big rock next to it so birds could perch, hop up and down. This is a great a way to provide water for birds. I would just fill it with the hose every few days. I didn't worry about it being pristine. It was fine if, if a few leaves fell in it. Uh, the only downside to this treatment is that it poses a danger if there are cats around because it makes the birds more vulnerable. And so except for the risk of cats as predators, this is, this is wonderful. If you're gonna have a bird bath or a water feature of any kind, the principles that you wanna follow are the same. You really wanna imitate nature. Having a slight variety of water depths is important, which allows different species of birds to occupy the level of water that's comfortable for them. Uh, the more naturalistic, the better. Uh, they like to have a footing. They don't wanna be on something where they can't stand and be stable. Uh, and providing shelter nearby is important. They don't like being totally exposed either. If you've got moving water is a plus, and if you have a, a, some bucks to spend, you can always create a water feature like these friends of mine did in uh, Medford, Massachusetts, a very nice little water feature. What was really sweet about it is birds do like moving, gently moving water. Uh, there's a range of depths here for them to go into. Uh, nice plants for them to hang out with. Uh, they definitely got birds using this, this nice feature. And um, they certainly a lot of common birds, but also some migrants when migrants were coming through. So we've talked a bunch about the snags and how I love the snag that I created. The um, top picture and the bottom picture here are actually taken on my snag after the downy woodpeckers nested there. And you'll see how much value as it decayed that snag had in providing insects for bird life through the all the entire time that I had it. I did eventually take it down uh, 10 years after I created it because it was getting rotten enough that I didn't want to have an unsafe uh, feature in my back garden and being a small space I I decided it's, it's time was done. Um, but that was only because it was the urban garden that I took it down. Otherwise, I would have left it entirely. But this whole decaying wood is, is very important for the life cycles of, of insects and birds. Uh, here's what we see often when we walk in the woods. This is a tree that's being uh, feeding a pileated woodpecker. Those, those are definitely pileated woodpecker holes. And it's interesting that foresters these days used to often fell trees and clean up the forest a lot and cut everything down. And, and foresters have begun to understand in the last few decades that the healthiest way to leave trees, even if they're harvesting some out of the forest, is to leave some trunks, to leave the branches, to not chip everything up. Uh, if I had had a snag like this in my garden, I would have loved it. I would have absolutely loved the chance to have a naturally occurring decaying tree, which to me is artistic, it's beautiful, and this one at my friend's um, house was probably being used and occupied by downy woodpeckers. You can see the holes there. Again, a naturally occurring snag uh, is an artistic thing. 
as well as an ecologically important feature. And if you think about our cavity nesting birds, so we all know woodpeckers, sapsuckers, which are really woodpeckers and flickers, those are all primary cavity nesters. But even chickadees and red-breasted nuthatches are sometimes primary cavity nesters who will nest in aspens or trees that are, have soft enough wood that they can drill their own holes. But after the primary cavity nesters, we have many, many secondary cavity nesters. And these are the birds who come in a year or two later and occupy the holes that have been created and abandoned by the primaries. So bluebirds, tufted titmice, flycatchers, many warbler species, wrens, brown creepers, and owls, of course. Those are all the secondary cavity nesters that depend on somebody else in the ecosystem creating their nests that they're gonna occupy later. And finally, let's not forget the value of brush piles along with snags. Again, it's all this process happening in the environment that provides protection and decay and the organic transitions of our ecosystem are what make it healthy. So the moral is, there are places maybe to be neat and tidy right around your, your most immediate house entrance. There's, you don't want chaos everywhere. I know people don't want that. But our tendency as landscapers and gardeners has been to make everything a little too neat and a little too tidy and how to integrate that landscape and the healthy landscape into one that still has ecological value. Finally, I just want to say a little bit about why we don't want birds like house sparrows. Uh, these birds really do displace other birds and they're called house sparrows or English sparrows because they were imported from England. And they were introduced around 1851. And William Brewster, who was a famous ornithologist, uh, he's the first president of Mass Audubon, he was the curator of birds at Harvard University, uh, lived in Cambridge, not far from where I used to live. And he witnessed what happened to the birds in that ecosystem, in that part of the city, back in right around 1873 to 1878, a complete change in the birds that were inhabiting that part of the city because of the introduction of the English sparrow. And in fact, there was such a debate between 1873 and 1878 over the effects of the English sparrow introduction that that period of history in the ornithological world is called the Sparrow Wars because some people thought it was fabulous that we had this new bird that we didn't have before. But good observers of birds who watched what was happening to the bluebirds and so many other birds who were now being driven out of where they had previously lived could predict what would happen with this explosion of population of sparrows. And there was a recent study done just a couple of years ago about house sparrow sites where house sparrows were dominant and present and how much that resulted in a decrease of other bird species because of the behavior of the house sparrows. So if you just think about how they behave, they're called house sparrows because they find every possible part of the built environment to be really suitable for nests. Here's the building nests in their eaves, they build nests under solar panels, uh, they love privet hedges, they love bobbed ewes. There are so many things that we do in our conventional environment that provides habitat for house sparrows who then become dominant in urban and suburban situations. So my philosophy is sparrow proof your houses and sparrow proof your landscape for the house sparrows that is. And that just brings to a few comments on bird houses. Bird houses are a huge industry. They can be simple, they can be fancy. They are intended to be homes for all these cavity nesting birds that we're talking about. The challenge of bird houses is that the size of the hole that's appropriate for bluebirds and a lot of the birds that we would like to provide habitat for is also the same one that is the size for English sparrows or house sparrows. And so again, in many environments, if you put up birdhouses, the house sparrows will dominate. They will drive out the bluebirds, they'll drive out the titmice. They will destroy their nests sometimes in order to create their own nests. So my advice to you is if you're going to put up a birdhouse as a, 
as a substitute for what we need, which is the snags and the natural environment where those cavities are present all the time. If you're gonna to try to create it artificially through birdhouses, please monitor the birdhouses so that you do not, if English sparrows do inhabit them, you can remove them. Um, English sparrows are not protected by the Migratory Treaty Act um, because they are not migratory and they are not native. So you can do, you can control, you can addle the eggs, you can remove them and you are, it is perfectly legal to euthanize the sparrows uh, to control that overabundance. And if you use bird feeders, the question is, what kind of birds are you attracting? Are you attracting the birds whose populations are in decline? Or are you attracting birds who are pests like sparrows? So what I did when I was in Cambridge, uh, because I did, we did have squirrels and we did have a lot of sparrows, was I used a Niger cedar. And that was the only, only bird feeder I would use with the hopes that I would get more goldfinches and some of the, the smaller, sometimes chickadees and juncos would come to that. Um, if you live in a place where you have good bird diversity to begin with, you may be able to put up a feeder and get a nice diversity of birds that you want to support. But again, the thought is, are you providing food for the birds who need it, for the species who need it, or are you providing feed for squirrels or sparrows or birds that you don't want to have? So here are the thoughts on bird feeders. More than 50 million of us do feed birds. It's an incredible industry, but more than one third of those species of birds, of the, all the species of birds are at risk of extinction. And as we know, many are species of moderate concern. So there is no way that we humans can feed the bird species we want to protect and we want to have come back without native plants. We are not in any way capable of artificially providing the feed through bird seed that those birds need. And they need the insects, they need the protein, they need the diversity of, of food. And we all know that over the past few years, we've had problems with avian flu and needed to take bird feeders down. So get at your native plants, get your strong gardens in there. And that's the best thing you can do to support the birds. Uh, not, don't, don't really have time to go into a few other things about other anthropogenic impacts that we humans have on bird, but I would encourage you to think about these things and just very quickly, uh, after the loss of habitat, the two biggest direct human impacts that affect birds and that are responsible for killing birds are cats and our buildings and pesticides. So these are things to be aware of. Um, it's estimated by a lot of responsible scientific studies that after, again, after habitat loss, cats are the biggest killer of birds. After that are the glass windows that they fly into sometimes during the day, but also very much at night during migration periods. Uh, I get very upset. This was my house in Cambridge, and this was migrating season. And on you know May of this particular year, a cat had killed this common yellow throat warbler and left it right at my front door. This is not a staged photograph. This is exactly what I found uh, left. And it is, it is true that they really do go after birds. So if you have a cat, I urge you to keep it indoors. Uh, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918 does make it illegal for us to kill any migratory birds without authorization by US Fish and Wildlife. So I don't think we should have cats do it for us. If you think about migrating birds, there are basically four flyways that are used um, throughout North America. About 80% of the birds that migrate migrate at night, which makes the lights in the night lights in our sky uh, very important. It has a big effect on bird migration. So there have been a huge uh, effort in recent years to have lights out movement, which is really, really nice and really important. And again, don't have more time to go into that, but humans can do it. We can do a lot. There is a tremendous amount we can do to make life better for birds. And I love uh, Barbara Mikulski's quote here. Each of us can make a difference together. We make change. So thank you for everything you do to support life for birds. I know how much they cheer me up 
and make me happy. And I think they probably make all of us happy. And there are some resources you're going to get a handout, so I'm not going to spend time on this, but these resources will be detailed in the handout that you'll get. Uh, and I thank you for your time and your interest and I'm happy to take questions. Wonderful. Claudia, thank you so much. That was fabulous. Um, it's so inspiring, uh, and especially on a 7,000 square foot lot. I'm watching what you did with that. I mean, I, I've got 9,000 square feet, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, time to get going. Um, I, I expect and 100 birds, Charlie. <laughs> uh, and the photos were just fabulous. One person asked how you had any time to work uh, with all the... <laughs> <laughs> with all the observations and photographs, fabulous photographs you were taking in your backyard. Oh my gosh, you know, that in some ways, um, I wish I had more time. It's a, it's, I often felt like while I kept and documented this starting in, in 20, after 2000, I started documenting the species, I never had enough time to sit and really yeah. do it scientifically. You know, like, let me say that I'm going to spend, you know, two days a week, you know, or two, two hour blocks of time a week to really do it. But it's, it's been, it's been tremendous fun. And um, I, I wish I'd had more photos because I don't have photos of all 81 species <laughs> <laughs> and they don't move. They do not hold still either. <laughs> oh, well, that was terrific. So we have about 15 minutes for questions and we have lots of questions. So we're only going to um, get to a few of them, but let me say to everyone at the outset, that everyone who registered will get a follow-up email from Matt, and it will include not only the handout that uh, Claudia referenced, but also a link to the recording. So those of you who asked for to see a particular slide again or um, a recap of the seven principles or whatever, you'll get a recording of the of uh, Claudia's great talk in a few days, and you can uh, you can watch it again and again. Um, so there were several themes that came up, um, multiple questions. One is about leaf litter. People were curious, so what's the best practice? You know, many of us have lawns as well as gardens and we can't leave leaves just falling onto the lawns. Um, if we rake them into our beds, how deep? Uh, does it matter what kind of litter? You know, if we have a lot of oaks, um, tough oak leaves, what do you recommend to people in terms of how much leaf litter and, and how to go about it. Yeah, I mean, in what worked for me in my small woodland garden was just leaving the leaves that came down in the area. I did have a small lawn area, um, but just leaving them where they came down. I I think a mulching mower approach is a good idea on lawns. You can you can officially get mowers that are supposed to be good at at mulching both mm -hmm. grass clippings and any leaf yeah. organic residue so that it just is broken up small enough that it becomes part of the lawn and then you're organically feeding your own lawn and not really needing to fertilize it in the same way you do if you're pulling all those clippings off site where you're really sucking all the nutrients out of it uh you, you can distribute leaves into certain areas i did uh sometimes rake up some of it and put it in certain back areas when you do that, you do risk making it, depending on the plants that are there, depends on how much will grow up through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in general, it's with a lot of the woodland wildflowers, like I showed in those photographs, they will come up, they're designed to come up through the leaf litter. Right. Right. And that's how they evolved. The leaf litter is, is protection for them over the winter. Um, if what I would suggest for people with oak trees. Oak trees do take longer to break down. That's more of a two year kind of cycle than a one year kind of cycle often. But if you go look in the woods and take walks in the woods, you will see what grows up through oak leaves. So for example, a typical uh, woodland area around Lexington Mass would be pines and oaks. And one of my favorite woodland ground covers is that myanthemum canadense, that little mm -hmm. teeny Canada mayflower, which is what some people call the native lily of the valley, which doesn't do it justice. But there are many species that are evolved to come up through that. So it and there are there were a few species of ground covers that that I like and had in my garden that also don't 
tolerate a lot of leaf litter. And those are ones that in their native environment tend to grow on slopes so mm -hmm. that the leaves fall off them. Yep. So it, you do have to learn a little bit about what you're growing to get your whole system working to be optimally green, but it's perfectly possible to do it. Ferns are fabulous. You know, ferns, they're, they're pretty tough and there are many yeah. different species to use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, thank you. Um, several people had questions about snags. They were fascinated by what you did with your snag. Um, is there a minimum diameter of snag that you would want to leave to create habitat and, um, are all trees about the same, you know, is a pine, is an elm, um, any advice? <laughs> and, yeah. and do you believe uh, an entire dead tree or are you best cutting it back to, to just the trunk like you showed? Well, if, first, I will, let me say this. I'm very much an advocate for this total ecological approach to our landscapes. And I think one can integrate that with beauty and with the kind of care that we want to have around our paths and our walkways and our houses to make things also aesthetically beautiful. So I wouldn't do exactly the same thing everywhere, mm -hmm. but in general, I would, yes, if I, and I will, I'm totally all for editing the landscape because, you know, a great example just is something like Acadia National Park. I, I don't know how many people know it, but a lot of people have been there and there are beautiful carriage paths that were made by the Rockefellers. And when they created those carriage paths, they worked with uh, Beatrice Ferrand, who was a famous landscape architect, and they created view sheds and clearings in trees so that you could have views and this is our this is human saying we're we're taking a certain amount of control over how our landscapes work so i'm not at all opposed to editing and managing the landscapes we have while we maintain something that is ecologically completely healthy um, but yes i would i would encourage people to leave those naturally occurring dead trees and let them do their thing in every point of decay, something useful is happening. Obviously, if it's a safety issue, you're, not, you're gonna take it down. Um, but there's no perfect, yeah, and to the, to the different species, yes, of course, they're quite different. Something like the primary cavity nester, the idea that a chickadee is a primary cavity nester when it doesn't have the same kind of beak as a woodpecker. So that, those downy woodpeckers were making a nest in a silver maple, which is a little bit of a soft, softer maple right uh it didn't happen for five years now maybe it didn't happen for five years because there weren't enough in the city or maybe that tree had to get soft enough over the five years for it to grow uh for the it to be soft enough for the woodpecker to be able to get into this inside clearly that little hole it had it worked harder to get through the first inch or two the outer layer of that snag than it did once it got inside it could start spitting out the wood chips and what was fascinating was as that snag continued to rot i got to see how big the nest was inside mm. so the hole that those uh, woodpeckers were going in and out of was about that big like a two inches maybe two and a half inches when it started to decay and i could see how big the nest hole was it was about this big. It was about at least 18, if not 20 inches tall. And it was that woodpecker had dug out most of the inside of that tree trunk. So mm -hmm. a little sapling is not going to be big enough for a downy woodpecker. On the other hand, if you're a chickadee or you're a red breasted nuthatch, you know, a small aspen trunk might be big enough. And even if it's not going to be the snag by itself, again, the decay and the insect life in that decay is gonna provide a lot of food for birds. Where I'm living now, there's two remnant patches of woods where some construction was done to build where, I, where I'm living. And those two patches of woods have so much life. Mm -hmm. And there's just, you see the birds flitting in there all the time, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, ah, wonderful. Um, several people had questions about um, the invasive jumping worms that oh. we've been hearing much about. Um, and we know they're in Cambridge, they're in Lexington. Did you have them on your property? Are they, do they provide food for birds? Um, what's your, what are your thoughts about jumping worms? They scare me a lot. They really scare me a lot. I mean, earthworms are not native. 
And so back when Grow Native was young, I think I wrote a column around 2013 about earthworms not being native. And we knew from research back then about places in the woodlands uh, where we're losing our woodland wildflowers because of earthworms. And there have been studies in New Hampshire and in Minnesota of documenting this. And in my own garden, I learned that I could not grow uh, wintergreen because earthworms were disruptive to its very fine root system. And mm -hmm. Asian jumping worms are so much worse. So I, I, here's my advice. You do not want them if you don't have them. I did not have them in Cambridge in my garden. Um, and I keep referring to it in the past tense. Uh, my husband and I just moved last summer. So we were there for 31 years. It's a little odd to talk about it in the past tense, actually. Uh, but we did not have them. Uh, I think once they get established, the uh, they're going to profoundly affect what we can grow. Mm -hmm. And that scares me a lot. I don't know. There are, of course, scientists working on ways that we might be able to control them. I don't know what the prognosis is for that. Uh, what I would suggest if you're gardening and if you're planting is you should know your sources of where you're getting your plants from your nurseries. And you really want to inspect and make sure that they are not uh, sending you or that you're not purchasing plants that have the Asian jumping worms in them. And I have one instance where I know they were being transmitted in pots. And once they're there, uh, I, I don't know that I don't know that it'd be possible to get rid of them. The other thing you can do, and this doesn't work for trees and shrubs, but I'm a big fan of planting plugs for perennials and ferns. Plugs, when they're ordered, you know, you get a tray of 50 and you get a lot of small plants, but they're grown in these containers and they're not going to have uh, jumping worms. And the nice thing about plugs for perennials and grasses is that you can buy a flat of 50 plugs for 70, 80 dollars and you get you can cover a lot of area. But in, we're all going to and you can do bare root plants. I mean, that's a that's a perfect way to not get Asian jumping worms, but start to really know your nursery sources and really, you know, people sometimes think plants cost a lot. When you think about how much work grows in responsibly raising plants so that we can come put these beautiful creatures into our environment, it's not really that much money. I mean, that it's not a money making business. And so buy good plants, support your good producers. That, that's great advice. That's great advice. And it's been encouraging to see in Massachusetts new native plant nurseries popping up um, around the state that just focus on native plants. And um, I, I think Grow Native has a, a list. Um, I know uh, Living Landscapes has a list, so I would encourage people to um, yeah, to patronize them. Um, well, it's with, there's still a shortage considering yeah. how much many of us are now on the native yeah. bandwagon. Yeah. But it's been great that it's it's has provoked a proliferation of of growers. Um, when you said, said recommended that people sparrow proof their homes, um, uh, several people ask, "How do you do that? What do you what <laughs> what do you have in mind?" I, I'd like to know too. Yeah, think like a Any sparrow. Advice? So look for every possible spot where you might build a nest if you're a little sparrow. Uh, when I when that wreck of a house that we bought in 1992, you know what, it took us a couple of years before we could even afford to redo the porches, but I knew enough by then and not wanting sparrows that, for example, instead of having a beam that's a rafter and a beam that was holding up the rafters and just having them sit on top, notching them so that, you know, that's a place that sparrows love to sit is where you've got a roof coming down and there's a little perching spot under the eaves of the roof as they love it. Uh, the the neighbor's house where I was uh, photographing, you saw them loving a little spot up up under the eaves. Anything that's flat enough, and even if it's fairly angled, it's a place that they can build a nest. Uh, they will use they will use dryer vents. Uh, they solar panels. The great that we're doing solar energy and that there's a proliferation, but 
there was a roof that I could see where solar panels were installed that became a total home for sparrows and pigeons. And so then if there's that space underneath, you've got to find a way to put a guard around them. Uh, it's, yep. I, I'm going to be getting the ladder up in the spring to take a look at ours. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned um, cats and the, the damage that they do. Um, and uh, Allison added a note. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Bird Be Safe, but they um, they create colorful collars. I don't think any self-respecting cat would want to be seen in one, but they create <laughs> colorful ca collars. I looked it up on the web while you were talking um, that, you know, because birds are more visually oriented than, than sound um, in many cases. Um, anyway, Allison found this very effective um, in keeping her cat um, from, um, you know, the amount of bird kill dropped uh, uh, precipitously. Now, there's Monty, um, our cat, and he's an indoor cat, and, and that certainly is the best way, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I would say certainly a bell is better than nothing, but I, I have seen cats with bells bring birds. Yeah. Um, and so I guess the only way to know for sure would be to scientifically you know, measure it somehow. But if you want to be sure, or take them outside on a leash. Yeah. Yep, I mean, it's yep. kind of, it, it seems kind of odd, I, you know, when I when and certainly growing up, you know, my family had cats, it wasn't like that wasn't the considered the normal thing to do. But I think, again, over 50 years, the change that we've seen yeah. in these loss of birds and in the populations and in the effect of all our activities does mean coming to terms with what we're learning about our impact. And so, um, yeah, it's not like yeah. any of us are perfect or that there's always the best answer, but I would say, um, I would, I would still encourage people to, yeah. to keep them well, inside. And as you said, as we've learned how much of a difference our suburban landscapes can make, um, it's not that we just need to preserve the vast forest to preserve our biodiversity, that, um, keeping your cat inside in suburbia can make a difference too. Oh, it absolutely makes a difference. It absolutely makes a difference. Yeah. Uh, let me mention to our audience, um, in addition to what uh, Matt will send around um, with Claudia's uh, notes, uh, if you go to the Living Landscapes website, you'll see the um, links to recordings of many of our past programs. One of them was Desiree Narango, um, whom you mentioned, Claudia, and who right. spoke right. Um, yeah. about a year ago. Um, there's also one from Doug Tallamy and a great one from Dan Jaffe Wilder about how to kill your lawn. So um, encourage people to, to take a look. Um, and I'm sorry, we could keep going for another couple hours, Claudia, but uh, we are out of time. The, the library needs to uh, close down. So let me just say again, how thankful we are to you for sharing what you've shared tonight. Uh, it's been fabulous. Uh, thanks to all the folks who have uh, joined us this evening. I've been watching the chat and seeing just how many people expressing their their thanks and appreciation for tonight's program. And uh, with that, we'll wrap it up and I'll, I'll bounce it back to Matt to say good night. Thank you very much. And, and I just want to thank everybody for coming. I really, really, you know, we do all change the world by what we do. And I will just say that there are times in my work with Grow Native where, you know, I just was plugging away all these years. And then sometimes I'll meet somebody who says, oh, I heard you speak three years ago and I started doing this. And we all do that. We all infect each other with what we learn and hopefully in a good way. So thank you all for coming and for loving birds and, and for, for wanting to be part of thinking about all this and how to, how to make the place better for birds, make the world better for birds. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you again, Claudia, and thank you, Charlie and Pamela, for putting this event together. And thank you, everyone, for coming. This event will be on the library's YouTube channel in the next coming days, and you will receive that email uh, with the information that they had mentioned. Uh, but I just want to say thank you again, and have a good night, everyone. Thanks.